Hello everyone. Welcome back to the Healing Growth Podcast. My name is Saiton Riga. And this is a podcast where we talk about healing trauma in an African faith context. Today's episode is a one about birth trauma and postnatal mental health. Hi everyone, I'm so grateful to have you listening on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Stitcher, Anchor, and Spotify. Thank you for sharing your feedback. Do share the podcast with your friends, rate it, and let us know what you think. Last week's podcast was on pregnancy and mental health. We continue on the topic, but a different facet, as we talk about birth trauma and postnatal mental health. This is something I'm extremely passionate about because when you talk to many Kenyan and even African women, chances are that they have had either birth trauma, pregnancy-related complications, a child in the neonatal ICU, or in prolonged sickness, they've lost a child or suffered mental health issues triggered by pregnancy-related things. When you talk to older African women, you also find that they too struggled with these things and many have still not processed or recovered from the things that happened to them. The thing is, there's not enough awareness, there's not enough detail on what it is that happens or could happen. Many times we discover these things when we're already pregnant and it's such a short time to pack in all this knowledge all these possibilities. In my view, I feel like it should be incorporated in everyday learning from as early as teenagehood for people to start understanding what goes on during pregnancy so that they can not only be more aware of of what happens, but also be able to support those in their circles who are pregnant. We don't have many sources of information in one place. We also don't have systems, plans, and resources for this aspect enacted widely in our medical facilities because of the issues in our healthcare system. When we even compare what systems look like in Nairobi in the 80s before the 90s um, IMF budget cuts, each area had a dispensary run by nurses who would collect the factual and social information to build a health case and do the treatment for the basic issues. And for what was beyond them, they would refer to the doctors who would come on specific days. So there would be specific days for dentistry, pediatrics, and gynecology. And all this was affordable for the ordinary Kenyan. Unfortunately, now it is mostly privatized and costs are immense. We are not investing as much as we should in building and growing our public healthcare system through developing our people, medical staff through, for example, the students, the postgraduate specialized students. And it is my prayer that regardless of politics, we get to a point where we as a country and as a continent purpose and invest in our healthcare system for the good of our people. Back to our key focus for today, mothers. Again, I feel like we're disadvantaged because of the lack of information One of the books I saw growing up was a book called Where There Is No Doctor. It was a book with practical information on illnesses, nutrition, caring for children, the elderly, and pregnant women. I feel like this is a book that we need to bring back for this generation of parents across the continent. I I would also like an updated one to include mental health and how to support those who are experiencing this currently, and especially for pregnant women. That aside, as someone who has walked this journey as a mother, I want to share the information I have found both in my determination to heal, researching, and from talking to many women and medical professionals. Please share this with your friends, begin to talk about your stories, and find help. It is my desire that you too walk on this journey of healing. I hope with time, we will be able to ensure that many more women have healthy pregnancies and not just healthy physically, but also healthy emotionally and mentally. 
that they can be able to deliver and get, go through the fourth trimester and beyond in good mental, physical, emotional, and social health. This episode will talk about birth trauma, what it is, the symptoms, the risks for birth trauma and how to deal with it. We, we will also talk about postpartum depression, baby blues, and postpartum anxiety. Postpartum psychosis will also be something that I briefly cover, as well as nutrition as a missing piece in healing. Preparation for birth and the fourth trimester. And finally, secure attachment bonding with your child and the conclusion. So we get right into it. What is birth trauma? The term birth trauma has two different definitions. In the medical space, birth trauma is regarded as the injuries a baby gets when being born. These can be very serious. However, another definition for birth trauma is PTSD, post-traumatic stress disorder, that happens after childbirth. There is a birth trauma association, and this is where I got the definition from. You can look them up online and see what they have. What they say is the biggest reason for birth trauma is a fear that either the mother or the baby will die. This could happen if the mother loses a lot of blood or has to have an emergency procedure done because, say, the baby's not doing well, for example, the heart rate has dipped suddenly. In my opinion, it can be expanded to add mothers who have had to have surgeries while pregnant or had premature babies with complications or bad experiences with medical providers. As a side note, I have spoken to women who carry this fear during pregnancy and many times are afraid to speak on it for the fear that speaking about it will make it real and make it happen. I dare say speaking out and seeking help from your medical provider prior from a therapist or from people who will pray for you will do the exact opposite. Speak out. Yes, there will be people who dismiss you because they too are afraid, but we have people who will be safe spaces and will work with you to ensure that this fear does not materialize. What are the symptoms of birth trauma? There are about four main ones and I'll go through them. Number one is re-experiencing the traumatic birth through flashbacks, nightmares, or intrusive memories that leaves a mother panicky and distressed. Number two, avoiding anything that reminds you of the trauma. For example, the hospital or women with babies or women who are pregnant. Number three, being hypervigilant, which is being constantly alert, irritable, and jumpy. You're worried that something terrible will happen to your baby. So I experienced this um, I gave birth in an election year and all the anxieties that come with an election year in an African country, plus having a very delicate newborn, all came together in my mind to create a crazy scenario where I was constantly afraid of the worst happening. I am thankful for the healing since and just even for the understanding of what was going on in my mind back then. Number four, feeling low and unhappy, sometimes with guilt and self-blame for how the birth went. Many times women go in with a set plan for how they would pl like the birthing process to go. When it doesn't happen, there's a lot of disappointment and guilt and just a feeling of failure. What I would say is this is something to process. This is something to be disappointed about but it's also something that you need to forgive yourself for. Not that you did anything wrong, but in acknowledging that you did your best and you did what needed to be done, you can let whatever guilt and self-blame leave because you acknowledge that you did the best that you could in the moment. I don't think this is something that women should carry over their heads and so my encouragement to you is process your disappointment, process it with a therapist, with a trusted friend, with your partner. But it is something that you need to 
walk through so that it no longer hangs over your head. Now, not everyone who has a traumatic experience has PTSD, but many do, and it is not something that can be healed by pulling yourself together, not thinking about it, or pretending it didn't happen. What are the risks for birth trauma? As we discussed in the last podcast, traumatic events or difficult events during the pregnancy would put you at risk for birth trauma. Factors such as loss of control, loss of dignity, hostile reactions from people around you, not being heard, and the absence of informed consent to medical procedures can be something that triggers birth trauma. Other factors that make birth trauma more likely are a lengthy labor or a short and extremely painful labor, physical complications from birth, poor pain relief, high levels of medical intervention, fear for your baby's life and your own, having a stillbirth, your baby having to stay in the neonatal ICU, poor postnatal care, the birth of a baby with a disability due to to a traumatic birth, previous childhood trauma, domestic violence, and a troublesome partnership or relationship or marital situation. Finally, men or other loved ones who witness a traumatic birth may also be traumatized as a result. The difficulty with birth trauma is that it is not always recognized and many times it is confused with postnatal depression even though they can overlap the treatment should be different sometimes it comes with loneliness and guilt of wondering why you can't be like other women who have recovered and are fine it may come with a struggle to bond with your child because inadvertently they can be a reminder of the trauma that you went through The lack of support from people who expect you to be a happy new mother and don't understand the grief and the struggles you face is another difficulty that could lead to deterioration of relationships. Many women end up being torn about wanting another child and being terrified of the process or being terrified that there will be a repeat of birth trauma. In the UK, it is reported that one in six women who go through pregnancy loss, have PTSD. I wonder what those statistics are in Kenya and in Africa as a a whole. One study puts that miscarriage can put up to 20% of couples where both partners are at risk of PTSD. Now with all these facts, how do you deal with birth trauma? My number one, as always, spiritually, Not everyone has access to the mental health resources that they need, either because of finances or access. But even in terms of research, there is healing and there is peace and there is an ability to get through things through belief in God and prayer and having the community that comes with it. So what I would say is make this your first resort and your first port of call. Again, I will not uh, denigrate the importance of mental health support. And so if this is something that is accessible to you, please do go for it. Make sure that you're taking care of your mental health with a therapist or a counselor before, during, and after the pregnancy. If there was significant birth trauma, you may need a lot more care. I nowadays see hospitals have resident therapists and counsellors and these are especially helpful while you're still in the hospital before discharge. Possibly you can engage them and even come to see them after you've been discharged. I feel for even the mothers with children in the neonatal ICU that resident therapists and counsellors would be extremely helpful especially as many of them have to be at the hospital every day pumping breast milk and for kangaroo care and spend they spend a lot of hours there without an ability to process what it is that they and the, their babies are going through. 
I would say couples therapy, especially before and in the fourth trimester, a safe space for both both of them to discuss their fears and concerns and what happened if there was extreme birth trauma. If this is not available, maybe meet, meet up with an older couple that is able to be honest about these things, that you can be able to chart a path or, or even just have honest conversations about the fears and the terrors that you had in the moment. Having a doula or Lama's classes or any other preparation classes make the fourth trimester easier, as well as having someone on speed dial that you can talk to and help you figure out what you don't know, as well as discuss the, the delivery and what went wrong and what, could, what, what needed to happen just so that you can have closure of some sort. All these work together in helping you have peace of mind around the experience and even delving deeper into whether there should be action that you should take. Another key factor is having a community. You can have a family, whether these are your friends, your chosen friend family, or your own family, or your partner's family, or a combination of all of these. Having genuine support really changes and makes this difficult experience much, much easier. Having a group of mothers that you speak to who have gone through similar things will also be a space that allows you to speak your heart and allows you to process what it is that is going on. And these are all things that I recommend. If you're in the space and you didn't have any of these, it's not too late to start looking and it's not too late to find the kind of support that you needed then. Now we'll go into baby blues, postpartum depression and postpartum anxiety. What is the difference between the three? The baby blues are feelings of sadness or moodiness in the first few days after your baby has been born. They usually go away by themselves within the first two weeks of giving birth and you don't need any medical treatment for it. It is caused by the hormone changes that happen after birth when estrogen and progesterone suddenly decrease and cause the mood swings that happen. Postpartum depression is defined as a complex mix of physical, emotional, mental, and behavioral changes that some women experience after giving birth. It may look like sleep problems, lack of interest in your normal activities, guilt, appetite changes, low energy, poor concentration, and thoughts about death or suicide. Other symptoms that are not shared often enough if you feel like you're really, really struggling to love your baby, extreme irritation and anger are also symptoms of postpartum depression. Crying all the time, for often for no reason, disinterest in the baby, loss of pleasure and feelings of worthlessness are also other symptoms of postpartum depression. The risk factors for postpartum depression are going through trauma or difficulties during the pregnancy and birth, having a history of depression, the age when you are pregnant. Postpartum depression is higher the younger you are when you're pregnant. Family history of mood disorders, limited social support, marital or relationship conflict, complex illnesses in your child and other reasons. Postpartum anxiety is when you have a constant stream of anxious thoughts and worries combined with frustration, self-blame, guilt and fear of being left alone with a baby. It can also come with physical symptoms such as heart palpitations, trouble sleeping, fatigue and numbness and tingling. There are three forms of postpartum anxiety. There is generalized anxiety disorder, which lasts for about six months. It feels like constant worry, fear about the future, trouble concentrating or sleeping, restlessness and tension. There is postpartum panic disorder, which feels like the shortness of breath, heart palpitations, chest pain, fear of dying, sweating and trembling. People with 
postpartum panic disorder may fear leaving their homes because of having a panic attack in public. For postpartum anxiety, the risk factors for it are social, lack of social support, isolation, stressful events, and previous personal experiences of trauma. The third postpartum anxiety disorder is social anxiety disorder, which is a persistent fear of being judged as a new mother or parent. When it comes to all of this, I would say the major thing that we need to ensure is that we are taking care of mental health prior to pregnancy, during and after. Working with therapists and counselors who understand is essential. And also, you know yourself. If you are an anxious person, put in place the things that you need to help you thrive during your pregnancy. Pregnancy comes with its own set of concerns, its own different sets of um, worries. And it is best for you to just work, work these into your sessions with your therapist or find someone that you can talk to so that you walk through this period without carrying any extra weight than you need to. Again, just like before, support groups are, um, are necessary. And for those who are close enough to the mother, if you notice these things, have conversations with her and her support system so that you can ensure that she gets the help that she needs. Simple things that you can do are things like getting exercise, sunlight, music therapy, massages, and doing skin to skin with a baby so that you can incorporate instant relief and healing for you. Another thing that is really important but a challenge is sleep. Get as much sleep as you can. It is a risk factor when you are not sleeping and your body is not resting. And sometimes it is easy to feel like the superhero, super mother. But not sleeping is one of the greatest detriments to your mental health and to caring for yourself and the baby. Plan in advance as far as you can. Especially if you don't have a lot of support, cook in advance before the delivery, clean, get cleaning help and whatever else you may need so that you have fewer decisions to make. Ask for help and practice saying yes. Be specific about the kind of help that you need, whether it's cooking, sitting with a baby while you shower or nap, running an errand or cleaning up. We don't need you to be a matire. We need you to rest. We need you to take care of yourself so that you can take care of your baby. For the men, talk to each other about these things and about what support looks like for your spouse, for yourself and for your other children. There are many more older men who've gone through this and who've been able to support their wives and family through things like this. Look for them, talk to them, talk to therapists as well. Understand how and what you need to put in place so that you and your family can thrive as a unit. For the gynecologists and pediatricians, this could be and should be one of the things that you monitor closely in subsequent visits with the new mothers to ensure that they get new and I'd say, let me just call them all new mothers so that they all get the help that they need earlier. Next, I go into the largely ta taboo topic that is postpartum psychosis. I learned of this really young and it was even the first condition I, I knew because I, I witnessed somebody go through this when I was very young. Postpartum psychosis is a men mental health emergency and in situations like this, the mother needs immediate care, which might also be admission to a facility for some time until she recovers. Most hospitals including even our national hospital, Kenyatta, they have a ward where they take care of women who are going through postpartum psychosis. It's very common. However, it's not something we discuss until it happens to you or someone that you know. It starts suddenly within the first two weeks of birth and rarely does it start in the later weeks. Its symptoms include hallucinations, delusions, loss of inhibitions, fearfulness, behaving in ways that are very out of character, feeling very confused, being in a manic mood, which is thinking or talking too quickly and feeling high, and a low mood, which is depression, lack of sleep, anxiety, and la lack of appetite. Doctors are not sure what, it, what causes it, 
but one is more at risk if there is a family history of mental health issues or if one has had it with a previous pregnancy, if one has had a traumatic birth or pregnancy, or al- already has a diagnosis of schizophrenia and bipolar. The worst of the symptoms usually last 2 to 12 weeks, but recovery can take time, sometimes even up to a year. It can be followed by depression and anxiety and a struggle to bond with their children. This needs a doctor's help, the gynecologist's help, psychiatric doctors and therapy, as well as a supportive community, because recovery is possible and can be complete. Recovery is largely dependent on the type of support that the patient gets and the mother gets, and it is necessary for the people around her to pull together to make this happen, even as they seek their own help. I go into something that people don't consider, which is nutrition as a missing piece of healing. In the past, our traditional communities had knowledge on how to care for and treat women who have had babies, down to what she should eat or what is needed if she had certain conditions. Unfortunately, with the rural-urban migration by our parents and our grandparents, we have lost a lot of cultural knowledge and key community support systems. For example, many modern women struggle with back and bone pain after pregnancy something that was handled with bone broth, dairy and specific vegetables and herbs to replenish your bone health. We sometimes have focused so much on snapping back that we don't acknowledge the need to restore our bodies to full strength and health after having a baby. I would say we need to educate ourselves on the things that our bodies need first before looking to Look a certain way. Recovery is one of the most important things that we need to do in this period because otherwise we then carry conditions and things that we, we need not carry. Some foods like rice and oats contain magnesium, which helps with sleep. Healthy fats are essential to balancing hormones, which nosedive after pregnancy. This is one of the expected reasons for postpartum blues and depression due to the fluctuation of the hormones and the effect it has on your brain. There is an initial severe drop in hormone level production immediately after birth because the production was to sustain the pregnancy and once you deliver your body understands that it needs to stop production. This is a scientific happening, a physical happening but it's, it's something that you can't support with what you eat. And this is not something that we necessarily know or talk about. And we could help each other so much more if we made this a key part of recovery for new mothers. If you had a C-section, you are likely also on antibiotics and you need to restore the good bacteria in your gut and in your body. You can do the traditional mala that's drunk by the Masai and Kalenjin, You can do probiotics and prebiotics, foods like bananas, onions, garlic, all work together to helping you heal. There are some theories on the gut-brain axis and its effect on mental health. So this is an extra reason to ensure that you take care of your gut. With all of this, how do you prepare for birth in your fourth trimester? Preparation for this is mental, emotional, financial, social, physical, spiritual, career-wise, and many more factors. What I would say, it is good to have a plan for your birthing and your fourth trimester. Now, not everything could or can go to plan, but it is helpful if you have a guide, which me- because it means that you've thought through what you would like and then thought through what you can do to put in place these things that would help you. Again, also mental preparation, very underrated, but so important. What does it mean to be a parent this time? Whether it's your first time or your second time or your third time? Are you, what does preparation for it mentally mean? Have you prepared your other children as well to be older siblings? What does it look like? Some people have to move house, others don't. There's so many things that 
come into play when you're having a new child. And so thinking through that is very helpful. Emotionally, what are your concerns? Are you able to share them in a safe way with your partner, your loved ones, even your doctor? Are you talking to a therapist or counselor? Are there ways that you can prepare emotionally for the change that's coming? When it comes to finances, unfortunately in our times, this is a huge, huge concern, mostly because the cost often feels insurmountable. The finances will determine the hospital you go to and the ability to get the things that you need. However, if you have community around you, you may be able to get the items bought or given to you, thus re reducing the financial load for you. When it comes to hospitals, thankfully, there are, are an increasing number of facilities that are good and affordable to think of. Socially, are your friends aware and prepared for the change in your avail availability? Have you planned how your people will come and see you or take care of you and your family after delivery? Do you have boundaries with the people that you need boundaries with? Do you have help at home? Do you have a nanny, maybe a cleaning lady? Do you have family? In this period, whatever makes your life easier, whether shopping, cooking, cleaning, is welcome. Are you able to have someone close to you who can tell you if you're slipping into a rage, into an anxiety, into irritability and help you get the help that you need? Are you able to get some sleep? Are you able to get nourishing food so that you can thrive and that the baby can thrive? Are you able to walk, get some sun, exercise, see your doctor? Are you willing to get help for things like lactation? Up until I had a baby, I thought that breastfeeding was natural, only to realize there's so many struggles around it and so many feelings of betrayal because the assumption has from your body because the assumption is this is something that you could do or could get. There is no shame in getting help. There are people who are skilled when it comes to this. When it comes to work, have you gotten leave? Have you sorted out the documents? There's what you're entitled to legally. Have you organized your time off? If you face discrimination, it is hard, but not impossible to find a way to have this sorted. And when it comes to returning to work, having a baby gives you a certain clarity about your career and making things work in a different way. And for others yet, it may increase the feeling of being trapped, but also still give you the courage to take leaps because of having a child. Spiritually as well, having a child may change your views. Secure bo attachment bonding with your child. The attachment bond is an emotional connection formed by wordless communication between an infant and you, their parent, or primary caretaker. The body ensures the production of oxytocin to increase the love and appreciation for the body. This is done by spending time with your baby, with non-verbal communication, and you can increase this by looking into your baby's eyes, interacting with them, and giving them a secure bond. The idea is to stay in the moment and experience and enjoy it. However, when you're struggling with mental health, one of the signs is switching off, where you're not present, but you're doing what needs to be done. It's something that many women have been trained in subconsciously. The numbing, autopilot, and disassociation it works against us and it works against our child. And I will say now, it should be a sign, especially when it goes on for too long a period. Even when there's no mental health issue, for many women, we're almost always thinking about what needs to be done and ways we're needed. And truth is, that list never ends. With a baby, you only have the now. Learn to enjoy that and to revel in that. It'll help you as well mentally and in our fast-paced world it may be more of what we need we need to be present in our everyday life genuinely and accepting of what is going on and changing what we can our babies need present mothers and we need to be present for ourselves in order to thrive with all this i want my most important takeaway to be support yourself mentally if you're pregnant and support the pregnant mothers around you. Have these conversations. 
Don't struggle in isolation, in shame and guilt. It's unnecessary. Moms, there is a better way to do this than to be sinking in guilt and struggling with the blessings that you prayed for and feeling guilty. There is relief. There is a balm of Gilead, the yoke is light. Let us practice in daily living, laying down the weights that are on us. Some may call it selfish, but we should remember that even Jesus would rest and take time away to replenish. We need to incorporate that into our daily lives, and especially in this season of being a new mother. May we make things easier and better for the mothers and babies around us, and foster a generation that has adequate care, and in doing so, learn to do the same communally and individually for each one of us. I pray this speaks to you and sets you free. You can find us on Instagram as healing.growth and on Facebook as Healing Growth. Thank you for listening. Please share this podcast with your friends and family, and especially a pregnant mother. My name is Saiton Riga from Healing Growth. Bye-bye.